Good morning. Thank you for your willingness to come and study what the Bible has to say about instrumental music. In 2012, your eldership spent a year studying instrumental music, and we found no condemnation of instrumental music in the Bible. In this study, we opened the Bible to see what God's Word said, as opposed to proving that our tradition was correct. Last year, we spent another year studying the subject and are 100% together and sure that the conclusions we made are correct and our understanding is under the teaching of God's Word. Josh Diggs is speaking for the eldership, and it is his desire that we stay under the teaching of God's Word. It is my hope and prayer that you will listen with an open mind, and our church will be blessed with many saved souls as we put Jesus Christ first in all that we do. Thank you for your attention. Hello, my name is Josh Diggs. I once attended here before this thing called COVID came and hit our family. It is so good to see you all. In all seriousness, I am Josh. I'm one of the ministers here. It has been a couple weeks since we've been here in person as a family because, well, we were having so much fun with COVID, we decided not to do it all at once, but to really get the flavor and just keep going. But it's good to be back and see you all in person. Today, we're beginning a four-part series looking at this topic of music and worship. And specifically, we're going to be talking about its use and the use of instrumental worship or praise in our Sunday worship. The reason we're talking about this is because the elders believe it is time for the Clear Creek Church to move in the direction of offering an a cappella worship service and an instrumental worship service on Sunday mornings. Now, we're going to go for the next four weeks, deep dive into a lot of content. I'm going to do my best to represent the leadership, specifically the elders, well. They're familiar with what I'm sharing, but it's going to take a few weeks to share everything. So I'm going to ask you over the course of today and the next few weeks, listen intently, bring your Bibles, open them, ask questions, listen, because as a family, we want to walk through this well together. Now, because we believe the Bible is the Word of God, can I get an oh yeah? Grab your Bibles and go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. We'll be there in about 10 minutes, but I want you to get ready because that's the text we're going to dive into. Let me give you a brief outline of what we're going to look at over the next four weeks to give you sort of a sense. By the way, grab your phones if you want. You may take some pictures of what's up here because we're going to move quickly and you may have questions and this will help. So over the next few weeks, starting today, we're going to talk about why become a both and church. We'll explain that phrase in just a moment. Next week, and this is the one I'm most excited about, is we're going to look at, does the Bible say it's okay? Because it does not matter what Josh thinks or anyone else thinks, Scripture is the final arbiter on truth for God's people. And so we're going to look at, what does Scripture teach? Then week three, we'll look at, well, what might it look like? This whole both and thing, what does that possibly look like? And that'll be a week where we'll hopefully be able to answer many of the questions that you have and some that we've already received. And then the fourth week, How do we move forward in unity? And this one, I think, is maybe the most important of the four. Not simply for unity within our body, but we're going to talk about how do you you have good, hard conversations with those that you love who may not even go to Clear Creek. After all, what mom and dad feel or what relatives think impacts how we feel about situations and topics. And I want you to know, this topic affects the Diggs family significantly. And so I'm excited to hear what I'm going to say that week because I need to be encouraged about it. So uh, we'll, we'll see on that one. <clears throat> then after that, we'll have two weeks of prayer and fasting as a church because this is a family and we seek God's will, God's face in all things and especially on significant discussions like these. Now, we want to give you some resources as well. So over the course of the next month, here's a few things that we want to help you have uh, to be ready as we dive into this We will be teaching on it from here, Sunday morning during worship. Some of you say, why are we doing this during this time? Simple answer. This is a big topic. It requires the whole family together. And we want to make sure everyone has a chance to be a part of it. Also, starting next Sunday, as was mentioned in the announcements, we will have a series, three lesson series, in the adult classrooms at 9.30, looking at material presented and provided by a preacher named Rick Ashley at the Richland Hills Church of Christ in Texas about 18 to 20 years ago. They covered this topic. 
Rick does a magnificent job, and there will be some overlap between what I say and what he says, but because of the format, it'll be about 50 minutes to an hour of pure teaching there, so he'll go into some things I won't be able to cover in the amount of time we have here. So I encourage you to participate at 9.30 in that. Also, next Sunday, we will have two position papers out at the lobby, and we ask you, pick them up. These are basically the way that the elders interpret Scripture, because you need to understand how they study the Bible. How you study the Bible determines what you get out of the Scriptures, and so you need to see that. And then the second one is their position paper on what does it mean to worship? What does that look like? What's appropriate biblically? And so pick those up next week. Also, if you have questions, the elders are available pretty much any time throughout the week. They're willing to get with you, but they will especially be available Sunday mornings in room A8. That's just down the hall here. And basically, if you have questions, they just want to love on you. And so it's a great opportunity. And then finally, because what mom and daddy think, what our relatives think, genuinely has an impact on our hearts. And some of us, and I got to tell you, I don't like confrontation. I don't know about you, but I don't like confrontation. But we're going to have some conversations with people we love. And so in March, we're going to have a one-night, 90-minute seminar workshop where we talk about how to talk about blank with your family. And it will be a seminar workshop on how to have good, tough conversations. So it'll be in the cafe. If we have more people than can fit in there, we'll come in here. We'll make space for whoever wants to come so we can help equip you in those conversations. Now, to our guests, you may be wondering, why did I show up today? I want you to know, yes, over the next four weeks, this is going to be a bit more of a family conversation, but I'm so glad that you are here because you're going to get to hear how this body handles difficult topics. You'll also hear our heartbeat for loving one another and loving the people who do not yet belong to the family of God. And I hope that you'll see how we treat one another in this process and get sort of a sense of, man, is this a place that I would like to be a part of? So I think this is a great time for you to be a part of this gathering, and I'm glad that you're here with us today. Let me give you, before we get into the text, I need to cover a little bit of groundwork here, so stay with me. There's a lot coming, but listen, and if you have questions, ask one of the leaders after today's gathering. They'd love to help you with this. But let me start with a big question, especially if you're not a part of the Churches of Christ. This is sort of new to you. You're like, what's the big deal? Why are we debating instruments or a cappella? That means singing without instruments. What's the big deal? So let me give you a little bit of history here that'll hopefully give context. The Churches of Christ, which we are one, the Churches of Christ are a part of what is called the Restoration Movement. The Restoration Movement began in 1809 by a variety of people from different denominational backgrounds. There were people from the uh, Presbyterian Church, from the Baptist Church, and even Pentecostals gathered together. Now, if you're like me, you look at that, and that sounds like the opening to a joke. A Presbyterian, a Baptist, and a Pentecostal walk into a bar, and you're like, no, they don't, they don't drink. And then you're done, right? (laughs) Some of you are going, no. Not the ones I know. (laughs) But they come together, and you say, when the world would get this group of different people to join and say, we've got to do something. And here's the bottom line. They were tired of watching Christians fight over what they saw as opinions, secondary matters. And they said, the Lord's church needs to be unified And we can do that if we agree on the main things and keep the main things the main things. Kind of a nice idea, isn't it, church? I don't know about you, but I've got a lot of opinions, but if we go by Josh Diggs' opinions, I'm not going to get along with anybody. And so this group of people gathered together, and they began what became known as a unity movement. One of the phrases was, we are not, we are Christians only, but not the only Christians. And they said things like, In essentials, unity. In debatable matters, freedom. In all things, love. So the way we treat one another is with love, even when we disagree on what they would call secondary or debatable matters. Now, you ask the question, you say, so so how did this group become divisive? Well, here's the reality. In a group that says unity is paramount, it is no wonder that we would have some groups or churches that would worship without the instrument, 
a cappella, and some that chose to use an instrument. Because the unity movement was not based on worship styles, but on Jesus Christ. By the way, I think Jesus should probably be our number one uniting feature. And so they gathered together. Now, the, those who said a cappella worship took the name, primarily took the name, the Churches of Christ. And they gathered and are here primarily in the South. This is true today as well as when they began in the 1800s. The churches that said we will use the instrument took the name Independent Christian Church, and they primarily started and still are up in the North. Now, these groups were almost identical in, in practice and in doctrine. In fact, here are some of our similarities. We all have a high view of Scripture. We have a high view of baptism. We take communion weekly. We believe in congregational autonomy, meaning there is not some board or body over the whole churches of Christ. This church, Clear Creek, is led locally by qualified, biblically qualified men. They are called elders. And that's how all in the restoration movement are organized, led by a group of elders. Jesus alone is the head of the church above any human authority. It's Jesus. And the Bible alone is our ultimate guide for belief and practice. And as a result, groups said, well, hey, if these are the essentials, we can differ on other things and still be united. So let's put that chart one time up here again. So you have a cappella in the south, instrumental in the north primarily. And we were united as a movement from about 1809 till the 1860s. Now, quick question. What major event happened in America in the 1860s? The Civil War. Church, how did the Civil War divide? North versus South. South versus North. Americans went to war with each other, they fought and killed one another, and many Christians joined. Now, we can debate the merits all day long. I'm simply reporting history to you that we were divided nationally. And what's interesting is before the Civil War, most everyone in the Restoration Movement would say, while I may not like what you do, I do not have a biblical issue with what you do. We can still be united and differ on this topic. That was before the Civil War. But after the Civil War, what once was freedom and opinion became, if you do it your way and not our way, then you are not only not a Christian, but you are going to hell. Isn't it interesting, and I know this will shock us, but isn't it interesting that politics drove our theology? Because that has never happened. I'll let you catch up on that one. Now, here's why I'm telling you this. It's not to make jokes or make light of this. I simply want you to see that the debate is not simply intellectual. This is also, also not exclusively intellectual. It is also an emotional debate. Because when you have had people kill your family members in war, you now will find any reason to divide. It is harder to unite after a war. And so I am sympathetic to this. But this is the history and where we came from. And so then the question becomes... Why now, if it's such a contentious issue even today, why would we talk about it? And I want to explain that to you very briefly here. The reason our leadership feels it's time to move back into our unity roots and become a both-and church, we're going to cover about four different reasons here in a moment, but it is very, very important that you understand that we recognize and the elders of our church recognize this is a big move and a big change. And change is sometimes very hard. Can I get a, uh, from anyone? I mean, come on. Change a diaper, that's hard. <laughs> there are all sorts of change. But change can be very difficult, and so the leadership wants to take time to process as a church. That's why we're taking four weeks just to even talk about it. Not to implement, just to talk about it as a church. And so that's what we're going to do. And I want to say this before we go any further. Over the past two years, this church has handled change better than about any other church that I have been a part of, whether it was the pandemic, whether it was how we had to restructure things, whether it was just dealing with loss, or many of you who are right now having to watch at home because of the pandemic. This church has handled change better than any church I've ever been a part of. 
I want to just commend you for the way that you've shown charity and love and grace, even when you disagree with others within this body. And because of that, the leadership of this church has every confidence and is excited to see how we will work through this together because we have demonstrated that when difficult times come, we do not fracture and run, but we come together as a family and we show love and grace. Now, before I tell you what's to come, I want to talk to you about what, is, it, it, what they're holding on to, what is not changing, what is very important. So put this up, please. We remain dedicated, and this is your elders, to three things. Take a picture if you want, because this is important. Number one, we are dedicated to our church affiliation. Number two, our a cappella tradition. And number three, our doctrine. Let me explain what those three things mean. Number one, we are not planning on changing our church affiliation. You say affiliation, what does that mean? We plan to remain a part of the churches of Christ. We will continue to be a church of Christ in the same way and to the same extent that we have always been part of this wonderful part of the restoration movement. Of course, and you know this if you've been here very long, we've always tried to emphasize the non-denominational aspect of our fellowship and our connection, meaning we want the name Church of Christ to be more a description of who we are. We are a church belonging to Jesus. We want that more than we want it to be simply a name on a building. You and I both know that a name on a building does not mean Jesus is in the building. We are concerned with that above all. Number two, we remain dedicated to our a cappella tradition. Now, I love this. This church has a history of offering excellent a cappella worship. We've enjoyed some of it this morning. Amen? Man, I love it. I was sitting up here. I was sobbing in the first service. Then I have to come up and preach, which was awkward. But I love this. This is just so meaningful. And we plan to continue to offer a cappella worship. We will continue to do that because we believe it is a beautiful and simple way to worship our Savior. So if you are uncomfortable with instrumental praise, or you simply prefer not to worship that way, you won't have to. You can continue to worship in an a cappella Sunday morning service. We're talking about having at least one Sunday morning a cappella worship service and at least one instrumental worship service on Sunday. And let me explain. I'll get a little bit more on how that might look in just a minute. But number three, we're also not changing our doctrine, and this is huge. At Clear Creek, we have consistently taught that there is nothing wrong with instrumental praise. We did not practice it on Sunday mornings, but we clearly explained that it was for practical and traditional reasons, not doctrinal or belief reasons. In our new members class, by the way, if you go through growth track, we will often cover this topic. And if you ask about it, we will explain that it was a tradition or a preference, but it was not because the Bible says so. Now, next week, we are going to dive into what does the Bible say. You need to come and bring your Bible. Don't just refer to the screen, because we believe that's very important. But we have not hidden the fact that we accept instrumental praise as a valid form of worship. We didn't use it on Sundays, but we didn't condemn other churches that did choose to use it on Sundays. We didn't forbid it at all Clear Creek gatherings either. So, for instance, we've used it at our coffee shops. We've used it at our Christmas at Clear Creek. When all of our kids were up here, do you guys, how many of you saw that? How many of you came to, that was fun. That was fun. We did it there. We did it for our Christmas Eve experience, our Good Friday experience. In fact, this morning, as you came into our worship, there was music playing. Was it a cappella or instrumental? Instrumental. Because that's something that we have said is not a problem. We just had not chosen to use it during our worship gathering. In fact, we even started and continue to support a church downtown, City Collective, that is an instrumental church. And so this has not been a matter of theology. And that's important because if you've been comfortable with our position on music up until this point, you should continue to be comfortable with our position. Now, the only thing that is changing, and I know this is a big one, we're going to talk about it, but the thing that is changing is our practice. I know that's still a very big shift for some, but our shepherds are trying to be very sensitive to that by allowing us an opportunity to think about it before it happens, which is what this series and the season that we're entering into is all about. So what is both and? Let's get a quick definition here. Both and churches embrace both a cappella worship and instrumental worship. There are two kinds of churches. There are either or churches, 
We either do this or that, and then there are both and, meaning we're going to do both things. In fact, there are either or churches, not just with worship, but with all sorts of stuff. So, will we either be a small groups church or a Sunday morning Bible class church? And at Clear Creek, as we saw this morning, we are both and. Will we be a church that reaches out to the lost or cares for our own members? And the answer is, to be biblical, we believe we have to be both and. So it is not simply on the topic of worship that we believe we must be a both and church. But as we're talking about it, both and means a cappella and instrumental options on Sunday morning. Now, while we'll get into how this looks, let me give you just the essentials here. On Sundays, there will be an a cappella worship experience, and there will be an instrumental worship experience, and between those two, there will be a Bible class hour, which means if you want to go to a cappella service, you can go to your Bible class as well. If you want to go to instrumental, you can go to your Bible class as well. So parents, you can still attend your Bible class. Your two students can go to their small group. Your children can continue to go to their Sunday morning Bible class, because it is important that everyone, this is so important, that no one violate their conscience for us to do this. We believe that's very important as a church. Now, let me explain how this decision was made, and then we're going to get into the text. Our shepherds have been asking two primary questions on this topic. The first one, is it biblical? The second one, is it expedient or helpful, profitable, missional? To the first question, is it biblical, the elders have been discussing this and have come to the conclusion that it is biblical, and they have held that position not for a few weeks, but since 2012. I refer back to the fact that many of us were here. By the way, show of hands, how many of you are here in 2012? May I see some hands? Hold them up and just look around for a moment. Many of you are here when this was originally taught, but do you notice how many hands were not here when it was taught? In other words, the elders of this church have held this position longer than many of us have been at Clear Creek. So this is not a new position. But we'll get into the details next week on that. The second question is that, is it expedient? And the position in 2012 was that it is biblically allowable, but it is not best for us at this time to have an instrumental worship service on Sunday morning. Now, while the elders have never changed in those 10 years on the biblical side, they have grown to see the expediency for where we are today. And we're at a different place today, and we're going to talk about that in a moment, than we were in 2012. What I want you to know is simply this. This is not a reactionary or quick decision. But it is a 100% unanimous decision by the men that we have asked to lead us as a church. Now, not every elder feels equally comfortable with the decision, but every one of them, if you ask them, will say they personally believe we need to do this. They are in agreement, and that is really, really important. Now, let's get into our Bible, shall we? 1 Corinthians chapter 9, I want to take you to a passage here because this helps answer the heartbeat question, why? Why are we considering doing this today? Why now? 1 Corinthians chapter 9, this is going to be just a a snapshot, but I want us to dive into it where Paul gives the heartbeat for why the leadership at Clear Creek is moving in this direction. Notice what he says. This is Paul speaking to a church in the city of Corinth, and one day we're going to go through that book because he is dealing with a church that is having to wrestle through divisions, what is essential and what's not. And Paul makes this statement. He says, though I am free and belong to no one, meaning he doesn't have to do what you say, even though I'm free and belong to no one. I have made myself a slave to everyone. Why? Say these words out loud with me, will you? To win as many as possible. This is his why. This is why he does what he does. It is to win as many people as possible. He says, that's my goal, is to win as many people as possible. And as if to say, I want to show you why, over and over, he's going to use that phrase, to win, four more times. Let's see if we can see it. To the Jews, I became like a Jew. Why? To win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. He goes on, to those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I'm under Christ's law. Why? So as to win those not having the law. To the weak, 
And I became weak. Why? To win the weak. I have become all things to all people. And now he's going to explain how he goes about doing it. He says the why is to win souls for heaven. Amen. And he says, here's how I'm going to do it. So that by all possible means, I might save some. Paul is very clear that for him, his understanding of why we are on earth is to share the good news of Jesus with other people and to invite other people into a relationship with Jesus Christ. And by the way, I would not be here had someone not invited me. You would not be here had someone not invited you. But then Paul makes this very interesting point, and I think this is so important. Because sometimes, sometimes, here's what happens. Sometimes we think that it's only to win the lost, or it's only for other people while we would, you know, bend and flex for people. But I want you to see, Paul doesn't even think it's just for that reason. Notice what he says in verse 23. He says, I do all this. Do what? I become all things to all people. I help other people find an inroad to meet Jesus. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, the good news, what we witnessed this morning, the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that there is hope tomorrow because he is risen today and we can enjoy it. That's the gospel. He says, I do this all for that. But notice this, that I may share in its blessings. Now, this is a very important church. The Lord gives us all kinds of different blessings. Amen? Amen? Well, three of us think so. Let's try this again. The Lord gives us all lots of different blessings. Amen? Amen. Okay, perfect. Let me give you one. Uh, if you have children, are children a blessing? Yeah. If you don't have children, is that a blessing? Yeah. Amen. I love you. Okay. If you're married, is marriage a blessing? Yeah. If you're not married, can that be a blessing? Absolutely. Here's my point. The Lord gives a variety of blessings. James will tell us that every good gift comes from God. But Paul is saying in this passage that there is a blessing, a kind of gift that can only be experienced when you partner with God in sharing the gospel for others. And Paul is saying, I want all the blessings God has. Yes, others will receive, but I don't want to miss out by not participating. You need to understand the heartbeat of the elders of this church is they want to reach all. They want to share the good news like Paul so that all may come to a knowing relationship of Jesus Christ. And for Paul, consider how difficult it must have been for him to change some of the things he did. He was the Pharisee of what? Pharisee. Some of you know the text. He was taught by the best of the best. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was the Jew among Jews, and yet he said, I will amend my preferences and opinions so long as it is biblical so that I may fulfill the vision and goal that God has called me to. And this is where the leadership of the Clear Creek Church is as well on this topic. Now, I want to share with you for the last few minutes here four reasons Four reasons why the shepherds believe we need to become a both-and church now. What's different today versus 10 years ago? What's the big deal? Why? And, and I want to be clear, there's a lot more. If I had time, we'd go through about a dozen, but I'm giving you four of the big ones, okay? And before I show you the first one, let me just tell you what the four are. Number one, it's to care for all of the Clear Creek members. Number two, it is to care for all of the children at Clear Creek. Number three, it is to be biblically consistent. We'll explain what that means. And number four, it is to win the lost. So let's walk through these. Number one, it is to care for all of our church members. You say, what does that mean? You may not be aware of this, but over the past few years, there has been an increasing number of people in this church, a growing percentage, who have come to the elders very respectfully and graciously, but who have said, we love instrumental praise, and we love this church. Is there any way we can do that as well? We're not asking to quit acapella, but is there any way that there is space for the rest of us here as well? And in fact, in this room right now, and I see some of you, some of those very same people are sitting in this room today around you. They're our brothers and sisters. Some of the people who've talked to us are not sitting here today because they have already left Last spring, I sat in Salsaritas across from a friend who was telling me, as much as he loves Clear Creek, that 
he would no longer be coming in part because this was so important to him and it stirred his heart so much and the leadership had yet to do anything for he and others like him. A question that the leadership team has really wrestled with, the elders have asked the question, is the eldership responsible to care for the entire church as equally as possible or only care for one group over another? And they have struggled to say, how are they caring for everyone if there's a way to provide both options without creating a violation of conscience for any one person? Then they should do that. And it comes in part from this verse, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. I want you to see the highlighted portion. This is the portion that speaks to elders. Speaking of leaders, it says, they, the elders, keep watch over you. That's talking about all of us. As those who must give an account. Give an account to whom? Church? To God. One day, any man who has held the role, the office of elder, they have a high responsibility to provide soul care, not just for some, but for everyone who has said, I come under your leadership. I'm a part of the body. And they have said, we must provide care for all as equally as possible. And we'll do it in such a way that you don't have to give up something, you don't have to give up your Bible class or that, and you don't have to compromise your convictions. But we must provide care because we love every member, not just some members in this church. The second reason is to care for our children at Clear Creek. Now, for some of you, you go, what does that even mean? Here's what that means. Some of our kids don't care about this topic. They come, they just want to sing some songs, they want to see Mr. John hand out $20 bills which I, I noticed he didn't say adults could do it, it's just the kids, so we'll need to talk, John. But so long as they do that, they're great. There are others in our church, other kids and students, for whom this is a big deal. By the way, in the car, are they listening primarily to a cappella music or instrumental music? Your children, not all, but some in this church, this is a big enough deal that they will do something else when they can do something else. You say, Josh, I think that's overstated. Friends, I'm telling you, we know this because they have told us with their words and with their feet. There are some who have left the church universal, but the churches of Christ in particular, in part because of this. Now, I want to be very clear. We do not believe that your children or other kids must go to a church of Christ to be Christian. Again, the name on the building is not as important as the name of the one who is in the building. But we do not want your children to have to choose their heritage or what stirs their soul. We want your kids to be able to, if they choose, to continue celebrating Jesus with the people who told them about Jesus. And the question that has come up is this question right here. What is the faith of the next generation worth to us? What, if you put a price tag on it, if you put a preference on it, if you put something on it, what would it be worth? And so the leadership team, the elders have said, why now? It's because, in part, we must care not just for some, we must care for all. And by the way, when you tell the next generation your vote, your opinion, your feelings don't matter, you've just told them that the church is not theirs until they get to a certain age. And this church, by the grace of God, is for all all people, regardless of their age. And so, if there's a way to offer both options without anyone violating their conscience, then the elders said that is a reason why. Third reason is to be biblically consistent. Biblically consistent, that means we do what matches our doctrine. What we say, what we teach, matches what we practice. And anytime we see something in Scripture or understand it more clearly... We want, as best as possible, to shrink the gap between what we read in Scripture and what we do on Sundays, Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, and again on Sundays. So we believe it's important to be biblically consistent. And let me explain one reason why this is really important. We live in a culture where everything is relative. Just because the Bible says it doesn't mean it counts anymore. So the church must be incredibly thoughtful about what practices we will stand on and say, even though the Bible doesn't say, we're going to make it an issue. 
Because our kids will be listening and watching to see if what we say is consistent with what we do. This is important for biblical consistency. Again, options so that no one has to violate their conscience. But if we can do it to care for all and be biblically consistent, then why would we not choose to do that? And then number four, finally, is really Paul's why, which is this. Remove unnecessary barriers to winning the lost. The fourth reason is to make a way to help people who may not yet know Jesus. Now, it's not just for them. We've just said it's also for you. It's for the friends who are sitting next to you this morning. It's for our kids. It's to be biblically consistent. And it's also for those who have yet to meet Jesus Christ. And as a fellowship, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but as a fellowship, we have not been doing a very good job with reaching the lost as a fellowship. A few weeks ago, Gary Carson, one of our elders, showed this chart. I'll show it to you again. This is a chart of the Churches of Christ membership in the United States over the past 30 years. And as you can see, it's not going in the right direction. If this were my financial portfolio or yours, would we be at all concerned? Oh, absolutely. I tell you, whoever was managing this would be fired. Or I'd get someone to do it who's not me. Because this is disconcerting. Why is it then that we are less concerned with these numbers than we are our own finances? Because these represent the souls of people. Did you know that since 2015, churches have been closing, and about 2,000 to 2,400 people have been leaving our fellowship since 2015? By the way, our church, considering how you want to break out membership, 2,400, that's about two and a half Clear Creeks every month is closing. Now, some people, and if you're, if you're a thoughtful person, which you are, some of you have even said, well, hey, isn't this all evangelical churches? All of them have been closing, right? Well, notice what is on this original report. It was on here on the chart last time as well. Churches of Christ shrinking rapidly when evangelical Christianity did not. Evangelical means that they hold the same essential truths that we talk about and hold to. And yet, we have declined when some have not. You say, well, Josh, tell me, which ones have not declined? You want to know one of them that has actually grown over the past number of years? The independent Christian church. The other half of our restoration movement heritage. Now, do I think that an instrument's going to save souls? No. Categorically. But do you know what? A singing voice won't save a soul either. Who saves souls, church? All we're talking about is if Jesus Christ is the one who saves souls and there are any unnecessary barriers, the gospel itself is a stumbling block. It's already hard enough. If there are any unnecessary barriers to getting someone to meet Jesus, then why would we not? So long as no one has to compromise their convictions or conscience, why would we not? And some of you may be thinking, well, Josh, I'm not sure that I buy this. Are you sure that this really is an issue? I want to share with you briefly a portion of a letter that a member in our church sent to the leadership team um, about 10 days ago. And I reached out to this member yesterday and said, would you give me permission to share part of this? I won't use your name. And the individual said, of course. So I want you to see why this matters. This is part of the letter. Thank you all for your prayerful and serious thought to this subject and the transparency with which you are working through it. I know you didn't ask, but I just want you to know you guys definitely have my support. Now he's going to explain why. Here it is. My best friend is a band director. His words to me years ago have always stuck with me. And I quote, I'd love to go to church with you, but I'm a musician. The teacher can teach at your church and use their talents to glorify God. So can the speaker, leader, and mechanic. But I never could at your church. And this member finished by saying this, I didn't have a good reply because he was exactly right in my mind. Needless to say, he doesn't attend with me. Now here's my point. The leadership of this church believes that they are responsible for the care of this whole body, not just a few, but all, for the children, not just some, but all, that we should be biblically consistent and, and that our hearts should beat for those that Christ died for. 
And if, like the friends who had the paralytic buddy, are willing to remove the roof just to get them to Jesus. See, the roof, getting them, to, you know, removing the roof wasn't going to save his soul, but if they could remove an unnecessary barrier to get him to Jesus, then maybe a man who is paralyzed physically and spiritually would go away whole because he got to meet Jesus. And if you have friends who don't know Christ, and this is a barrier, don't you want to remove a non-necessary barrier so your friend today may be your friend for eternity. This is the heartbeat of the leadership here and the reason why. Now, we've gone long. I appreciate your patience. I want to give you one final thing before we finish this morning, and it's simply this. What we're talking about doing today is simply walking out the great tradition of our forebearers, You understand that we're here today because others who have gone before us have made similar decisions through the centuries to reach you and me and others. And it didn't just begin a few years ago or a few centuries ago. This began within the first 15 years of the church's birth. You and I are here because in Acts chapter 15, a predominantly Jewish church made a a cataclysmic decision. In fact, put this up. We might not be here today if, get this now, if the first Christians did not embrace Paul's by all possible means attitude. You say, what do you mean? Before he puts it up, the early church believed in Jesus and continued to hold on to circumcision. This was a barrier for the Gentiles who did not understand its purpose and were not real keen on going through that little ritual. Can I get an oh yeah? And so the church begins to discuss in Acts chapter 15, what must we do so that other people may come to faith? And this was a big deal. This is a much bigger deal to them than instrumental worship has ever been to the churches of Christ. This would be um, more similar to if someone were to say, we don't think baptism needs to be practiced. That's a big deal. And so they began to pray about it. They studied Scripture. They talked and debated. It was heated. Not everyone loved the way it was going. You get a sense of it in the flavor of the text of Acts 15. But after seeking the will of God, looking at the Word of God, praying to the Word of God, Jesus Christ, and debating among themselves, James, the apostle, says these words that have forever changed the trajectory of the church. He said, It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God that we should not put anything out there that is unnecessary to someone else coming to faith. Do we want to hold on to circumcision? Do you notice also in Acts 15, they don't say they have to give up circumcision in Acts 15. Those who think that's important and want to embrace it, at least at that point, said, hey, why not? But for those that it was a barrier, they said, why make it a barrier? And friends, if this is a barrier for those in our church, why would we hold on to it? Why would we not create two options so no one has to violate their conscience? If this is a barrier for some of our children to be able, if they wish, to stay in the church of their youth when they get older, why would we not? And if this is an unnecessary barrier to your friends that you know and love from coming to know Jesus possibly, then why wouldn't we take out every unnecessary barrier? That's really the question before us, and that's the question the elders over the next few weeks want us to to individually consider with open Bibles and open minds and open hearts and discuss and debate and ask questions so that perhaps more people come to know Jesus Christ and our body will be encouraged along the way. Now let me tell you where we're going the next few weeks, just a reminder. Next week we're going to look at, does the Bible say it's okay? Because if it don't, we won't. But if it does, then we'll move on further into our conversation. Number two, the week after that, we'll look at what it might look like. And then finally, how do we move forward in unity? How do I talk to mom and dad and aunts and uncles and friends about this? Because truthfully, for many of us, this is less a personal issue of theology and it's a relational issue of how am I going to have that conversation with friends or family that I love, but I know this is going to be hard. And we want to walk together through that. So, the first step today is we're going to stand and we're going to pray together as a family, as one body. Although we may not all agree on this, we are going to pray to the one who is something we agree on, and that's Jesus Christ. So let's stand.
If you're standing next to a family member or friend that you feel comfortable holding their hand, I'd encourage you to do that. Father, we thank you that you are with us today and that you love us. We admit we don't know the best way to communicate. We don't know all the details to everything. But we rest in the comfort that your Spirit is with us, that you have given us your Word, and that you've put us in a family that genuinely loves one another. I pray that your hand of peace will be on every person here. For those who think this is the biggest issue in the world, I pray for your comfort. And for those here who think this is such a non-issue, why are we discussing and why can't we just move? I ask that you give them patience and that together we could show love and grace to each other through this. Jesus, I thank you that you condescended to us by coming, that you did not demand that we come to you, but you came and found a way for us, that you united us with the Father. We ask that you will help us in these days to come, that we will love each other and love you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.